Great job. Set free. If you're here this morning and you're a follower of Christ, you've been set free. And if you're here this morning and you're not a follower of Christ, you can be set free today through the work that Christ did upon the cross, through the blood that he shed on our behalf. Y'all, come on. Come on. It, you, you won't bother me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the work that goes into that. We're still in experiencing God. It's been an interesting week for me after last Sunday. Uh, Wednesday night, there was a good group of us that gathered and went through the study and watched Henry Blackaby, and I answered a lot of questions. One of the questions I answered repeatedly on Wednesday night was, did I buy the car? Because <laughs> last week, men, if you all will remember, I was talking about the, the, the perhaps God-given capacity and tendency anyway that men have to rationalize where we can buy what we want to buy. Women, I think you all are pretty good at it too, so don't, don't take much of a back seat. But the answer to did I buy the car, I did not buy the car. I did not buy the car, but someone else did. <laughs> so anyway, I, I, I did not buy my wife the convertible. Last week we were talking about reality number five, to my left, your right. God's invitation for you to work with him always not sometimes, always leads you to a crisis of belief that requires faith in action. The invitation always leads us to a crisis of belief and faith and action. And Charles, your prayer fit in so beautifully. I know Charles and Sharon know experiencing God well. They have lived experiencing God. They've been through the study. They're using materials that are from a different era when I look at the book that they're using, but your prayer fit in so beautifully. Our capacity to follow the invitation that God gives us, what he's doing among us. There are those perhaps here today, many of us desire that Jesus would give us an invite. He would give us the opportunity, maybe even an assignment, to join him in what he is doing. We long for the opportunity as long as it is on our terms and does not inconvenience us or require major adjustments in our lives, which takes me to the sixth reality over here. If you're not going through experiencing God, you can read this to my left, and it's reality number six. You must make major adjustments in your life in order to join God in what he is doing. Ouch. Ouch. Henry says every time that God spoke to people in Scripture about something that he wanted to do through them, every time God spoke to people, major adjustments were required. Let that sink in just for a moment. He said once the, the adjustments were made, once the individuals were willing to make Whatever the necessary adjustments were, God accomplished his purposes through those he called. Blackaby says, adjustments prepare you and prepare me for obedience. And I quote him, you cannot continue life as usual. You may, this may not be what you want to hear this morning, but hear the words that we're studying. You cannot continue life as usual and stay where you are at the same time. And go with God. It doesn't work that way. That's the truth of Scripture repeated time after time after time. We're going to see that principle this morning in a very, very familiar story in Matthew's Gospel. We're going to see that in the lives of Peter, Andrew, James, and John in Matthew chapter 4 in the calling of the first disciples. I want us to paint a picture to try to get in our own mind what it was like that day 
there beside the beautiful Sea of Galilee in one of the most magnificent areas of all the Holy Land. I've been there a couple of times and I can remember what it was like to arise early in the morning before anyone else was up and to walk down to the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee and just sit and ponder whether or not our Lord Jesus had ever stood where I stood in those peaceful early morning hours. The Sea of Galilee is actually a lake. It is some 60 miles north of Jerusalem. You see it on your maps of the Holy Land. It's one of the most beautiful areas. It's also called the Sea of Canareth, the Sea of Tiberias, and Lake Genesaret in the various Gospels. It's in the Jordan Rift Valley, and one of the peculiar things about the, the Sea of Galilee, actually a lake, is that the Sea of Galilee is nearly 700 feet below sea level. Just picture that. 700 feet below sea level. And on multiple sides around the Sea of Galilee, there are mountains that, that, that we might not consider huge, but they tower about one half mile, 25, 2600 feet above the level of the lake. So you, you've got a half mile difference between the peaks of those mountains and the lake level, the surface of the lake. And that's important because the unusual topography, geography, the unusual landscape invites very sudden downdrafts that move quickly down the mountain and can blow up a storm very, very quickly on that lake. I got I to gotta, I gotta digress just for a moment about my dear brother in Christ, Brad Lauer. He did not know I was going to do this. I did not ask his permission. It's too late for that. I've already started. He and I were together at Jonathan Creek. He was running our camps, and I was trying to, to hold everything together between Cedarmore and Jonathan Creek. And a, if, if you've been out on Kentucky Lake, perhaps you know that severe storms can blow up very, very quickly on that lake. It's a big lake. It's a body of water in some cases, creates its own weather. Well, one night, uh, it, I don't think camp was in session. It was not in session. This huge storm came up, and Pam and I lived about, uh, we stayed off campus, we lived probably 10 minutes. The storm came up, and, and I, got a, I got a call. Not a good call. It was not from Brad, I don't think. Our dock had blown away. Not part of the dock, the dock. The dock had broken loose from its moorings, and here was the boat dock from Jonathan Creek Camp and Conference Center floating down Kentucky Lake in the winds. I thought, oh goodness, we're ruined. The dock will be ruined. Pam and I drove very, very quickly there to Jonathan Creek, and I looked down, and our pontoon boat was gone. This pontoon boat that we had and used for our campers every day. And I began to ask questions, and I quickly dis discerned that, that, that my brother in Christ, my right-hand man, Brad Lauer, was out on that pontoon boat chasing the boat dock. <laughs> I thought, you got to be kidding me. So it's just a little bit of local color into my life and his life again. We did get the boat dock back. The pontoon, everybody made it through the storm safely. We had to tow the boat dock back down the lake. The boat dock blew into another man's boat dock who was not happy with it. But, but that is the kind of weather that could develop on the Sea of Galilee. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 4. I want to begin reading in the 17th verse rather than the 18th verse. Jesus is preaching. He's preaching in the land of Galilee, around the lake. He's gone from Nazareth. 
Scripture tells us that it's in the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. Verse 17, Matthew chapter 4. Let me ask us to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word this morning. Stand if you can, if you are able, and if you're not, God understands, of course. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. Now, brothers and sisters, let me interject right here. I know that if you've been in church for any amount of time, you have heard this passage of Scripture. You know the passage of Scripture. But let me urge you to pay particular attention this morning as to how it might fit with experiencing God. Simon Peter and his brother Andrew were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. And at once they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. And they were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. And Jesus likewise called them, and immediately... They left the boat and their father and followed him. Let's pray together. Father, we pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you would take us there this morning to the shores of that beautiful Sea of Galilee. Lord, help us get a clear mental picture of what was happening there that day with Jesus and Peter and Andrew and James and John, that we might Learn from this living word the truth that you would have us glean. Change our hearts and lives according to your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, church. Jesus is walking along and he sees two men, Simon, Peter, and Andrew, and he sees them casting a net. That cast net, as we call it, would usually be circular, 20 to 25 feet in diameter, and around the perimeter of the net would be lead weights. So what the fishermen would do would be to cast the circular net, and it would fall to the bottom of the lake, thanks to the weight of the lead that was around the perimeter, the circumference, the whatever, I don't know how you describe it, but you get the picture. And that net would settle to the bottom of the lake very quickly and hopefully catch some fish, trapping fish. It was hard work. It was not easy. And Jesus comes along and he calls out to them. He says, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So there they are in the midst of their work and the text tells us that at once, at once, immediately, if you will, they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two more brothers, the sons of Zebedee, James and his brother John. And they were in a boat, the scripture tells us, with their father, and they were not casting their nets, they were preparing their nets. I am not a particularly wise student of Greek, but the Greek in this passage of Scripture has more to do with mending and fixing. So maybe they had been out all night the night before and their nets needed repairing. Either way, they were not casting their nets. This would have been a different kind of net, much larger, and they were, they were in a boat if you've been to the Holy Land, you will, you will, in this area, you will particularly remember that, in, that maybe you saw it in 1986, two young locals who were archaeologists discovered a boat that is known as the Jesus boat. And they looked down one day and there were a couple of pieces of wood sticking up out of the sandy, muddy soil in the bottom of the lake. And they thought, what have we discovered? And carefully, very, very carefully, over the course of subsequent months, that boat was raised and is now in a museum. And you can, if you go there, you can see with your own eyes 
what those boats were like in the day of Jesus himself and how the boats were large enough that far more than one or two people could be found in that boat. Jesus sees James and John using the trammel nets, as we call them. And what Jesus does again, he interrupts the work that they are about, repairing their nets. He interrupts their work, he calls them, and at once again, they leave their boat and they leave their father and in so doing brothers and sisters realize very carefully we know this text as the call of the first disciples we know about the call to to make them fishers of men but understand this morning that very clearly jesus requires of them major adjustments in their lives in order to follow him they cannot stay where they are and go with Jesus at the same time major adjustments these adjustments are going to impact their lives their relationships their livelihood their obligations they leave their nets they leave their boat and the implication here is that they leave everything behind the tools by which they make their living. Peter would state in 19 verse, chapter 19, verse 27, we've left everything to follow you, Jesus. And they did. We should note here that while their response to the call of Jesus was immediate, it was not the beginning of their relationship. Turn back, turn over in John's Gospel, if you will. John's Gospel, chapter 1. Earlier than this, earlier than the the story of the account in Matthew. In verse 35 of John 1, the next day John was there again with two of his disciples when he saw Jesus passing by. He saw, look, the Lamb of God. And when the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? And they said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he says, come and you will see. So they went and saw him where he was staying and spent that day with him, and it was about the 10th hour. So it's important to note that this was not their first encounter with Jesus, and they were familiar with his mission. But Matthew chooses to emphasize the immediacy with which they responded, the urgency. They do not delay. So in this text, back in Matthew, we have what we might call the first four. Simon Peter, who would eventually become the unofficial leader of the group. Andrew, not nearly as frequently mentioned as the others. James, whose follow of Jesus Christ would lead him to martyrdom, the first of the apostles to be martyred. And then finally, John the self-proclaimed disciple whom Jesus loved in his own words. And the call of Jesus to follow him is to leave their occupation from fishing for fish to fishing for souls, as we mentioned, as you mentioned earlier. Charles, I wonder... It's almost as if we're having a conversation based on your prayer. But I wonder today, even as we pray for this church in which many of you all have invested your lives, I wonder if there are not moments in the life of this church where we spend more time fishing for other stuff rather than souls. The passion that we once had to see souls saved. 
The energy with which we once invited people to come to this church and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ loudly and clearly proclaimed and the balcony was full and the lower level was full. Fishing for souls. How much of our energy, church, how much of our energy, our time, our work, our thoughts and prayers is spent fishing for souls? It's not that the work we do is unimportant. It is important. But is it as important as fishing for souls? Several chapters later, turn over to Matthew 9. Matthew 9. The calling of Matthew. In verse 9. We pick up the text. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they asked Jesus' disciples, why, why in the world, I can think, why? Does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And on hearing this, Jesus said, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Then the last part of that verse. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Matthew is a despised tax collector. He cooperates with the Roman government. He's despised for his role. He's despised for that cooperation. He's despised for his representation of the Roman authorities. But our text tells us that Matthew clearly answers the call and follows Jesus. The command to follow Jesus for sure, is a call of a physical following. But it's also a call, as we saw in the 17th verse of chapter 4, it is a call to repentance. It is a call to turn from one way of life to another as we follow Jesus from sin to salvation. The words, follow me, occur some 13 times in the Gospels, but there are many other references than we see this morning regarding one who is said to follow Christ. But we should remember this morning that the followers were not merely hearers. They didn't merely hear the call of Christ. They actually followed their master around as students did in those days. They were, if you will, they were like trainees. They did what they observed and were taught to do. Imagine that, that's a novel approach. To follow Jesus, to follow the master around. There's a direct line from this text, I believe, from Matthew 4 and Matthew 9 to Matthew 28. Jesus' command to you and to me, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Such a command, such significance. What does a command mean for them? What does a command mean? mean for you and for me today? What does it involve, the command to follow Jesus? Well, I would present to you this morning that the command to follow Jesus involves several things on our part. Number one, Charles, as you mentioned, and as experiencing God and Henry Blackaby make clear, the command to follow Jesus, first of all, involves obedience. Doing what he says to do. Those commanded to follow Jesus in our text this morning immediately left their nets and their boat. And their, they, they left their stations in life. I can remember, I look over at the students over here to my right. Our daughter, when she was a student in college, and she's 41 now, and our youngest daughter celebrated her 37th birthday yesterday, 
But, but when our daughter was in college, she was preparing to teach. She teaches now in Louisville. But as she was preparing to teach, her plans, her preparation got interrupted. And God called and called her to go to the mission field as a journeyman for two years with the International Mission Board. She ended up in the Philippines as a tall, red-haired gal in the midst of a shorter Asian people. She could see over the tops of everybody when they, she went to the market. I can remember when first time we visited her there in the Philippines, in that little community. I, we went to the market, and, and, and we were a novelty. She towered above everybody. But she spent two years there. Her plans were interrupted. But what God did through her and in her in the two years continues to impact her life today. And I, I think about the students, and I think about the students at the university and the students at the high school whose lives are so malleable and in whom God is still molding and making you all into what he wants you to be where he wants you to invest your lives, and in what he wants that investment to be. And let me just say, from the very young to the very old, our willingness to make adjustments. I ask a question of the group Wednesday night there in prayer meeting. Because it's, it's not an old group, but it's older, okay? I mean, it's, it's prayer meeting. And, and, and I ask I wonder how many tonight come into this room really eager to make major adjustments in your life. Well, you know what the answer to that is. I doubt that anybody, even in this sanctuary this morning, came in and said, oh, I am ready to make adjustments. Lord, just show me whatever adjustment you want me to make. No, no, no. Next week, we're going to deal with the cost of obedience and the kinds of adjustments that God requires. And oftentimes, they're not easy. And they require sacrifice. And they require courage to follow him sometimes where he leads. The first thing the command to follow Jesus involves is obedience. Second is repentance. I mentioned that moments ago from Matthew 4, verse 17. And Jesus again in chapter 9, verse 13, he says, I've come not to call the righteous but to call the sinners. Peter said to Jesus in Luke's gospel, get away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. Jesus is the holy son of God. He is sinless. He was sinless then. He is sinless today. A call to follow Jesus is a call to repentance, to turn from our sin to salvation call to follow Jesus is a call to submission. Look at Matthew 11, chapter 11. Jesus describes the call to follow him as putting on a yoke, if you will. Submitting to him for the work that he assigns. Submit is from the Latin word sub, meaning under, and mito, which means to put in place. Thus, submission means to be placed under the authority of another. That is not a popular concept today. In Matthew 11, verse 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Obedience, repentance, submission, trust. We are not going to follow someone wherever he leads if we don't 
trust them? Do we understand that God, while he expects us to be willing to sacrifice, while he expects us to be willing to adjust, that ultimately God wants what's best for every one of us that is here this morning. He doesn't want the worst. He wants the best. The last characteristic and requirement that I'll give us briefly as we close this morning is the word commitment. There was a popular ad for one of the wireless carriers a few years ago. The wireless business is competitive. Some of you all may be in that business. It was, the ad was regarding the required contract for the wireless carrier, in this case, the lack thereof. This carrier did not require a contract. So in other words, you could get the, the cell phone somewhere. I left it on my desk. You could get the cell phone and you didn't have to sign a contract. And in the ad, there were two young ladies. And, and one of the young ladies is looking at the phone that the other one's using. The, lady, the young lady who's holding the phone says, yeah, I didn't even have to make a commitment. Immediately the other one responds says, oh, that's great. I'm all about no commitment. Brothers and sisters, it's part of our culture today. All about no commitment. Here's what we enjoy doing today. We love to keep our options open, don't we? We, we really do. Keeping our options open, that is not what Jesus, what Henry is talking about in this sixth reality. we got to close today. I read this week a prayer. Let me give you the prayer. This is written, it's very brief, but it's written by a Canadian by the name of Oswald Smith who had a missionary heart, but whom God used to preach and teach for years and years and years. He made multiple trips, two dozen trips all over the world, but but in in his heart was was for for the, the, the good, take the good news to the uttermost parts of the earth, but much of his life was spent in North America. Hear this brief prayer. Would you be willing to pray this prayer today? I want thy plan, O God, for my life. May I be happy and contented, whether in the homeland or in the foreign field, whether married or alone, in happiness or in sorrow, in health or in sickness, prosperity or adversity. I want thy plan, O Lord, for my life. I want it. I want it. Would you be willing to pray that prayer wholeheartedly today? we got to close in a moment, David. Our musicians are going to come and lead us in an old hymn of our faith, I Surrender All. All to Jesus, I surrender all to him, I freely give. We're going to sing. I want to pray, however, before we sing, I want to pray that God would stir the hearts Would you be willing to pray this morning? I want it, Lord. I want thy plan for my life. I want it. Oh, how I want it. The call to follow Jesus requires perseverance. It's not merely a one-time move in your life. It's an ongoing movement of God in your life. That whenever, wherever he leads you, regardless of the adjustments that he calls you to make, you're ready to go. More than willing, you're ready. If you're here this morning, you don't know Christ as Lord and Savior, you heard what I said about being set free at the beginning of this. Regardless of the burdens that you bring to this place today, the weightiness, hear the words of Jesus. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. The invitation is for you to come to Christ this morning. In a moment, our pastors will be down front. We invite you to respond as God leads you. If you're here looking for a place in which you can invest your life, we invite you to come this morning as well and talk to our staff. Talk to one of our pastors about investing your life here at what God is doing at Campbellsville Baptist Church. Let's pray. Father, we bow our heads before you. 
God, if I am indeed right in my estimate, there are very few, if any, that have come into this sanctuary today looking for reasons to make adjustments in our lives. God, I'm in that group. I, 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 I love, I thank you for what you allow me to do at this stage of life, that you allow me to be here with these dear people in Campbellsville and to stand in this pulpit every day. And Lord, I drive down here today, over here, whatever it is. I don't want to make any more adjustments. I love what I'm doing here. But oh God, may each of us, every one of us, remain willing to make whatever adjustments you desire that we make with regard to following you. Father, for those that have never decided to follow you, Lord, would you show them this morning how much you love them and how you proved that through your death upon the cross, the blood that was shed, the blood that washes one white as snow, In Christ's name, we come in prayer. Amen. Let's stand, church, as we sing together today.